This is Back of the Net and Beyond. My name is Danny Thomas, and this is where I speak to current and former athletes and figures within sport, um, just about how athletes have transferable skills which are suited to other industries. Today, I'm going to be speaking to Tony Wormsley, who's a performance coach. How are you doing, Tony? Are you OK? Danny, I'm really well, thank you. It's great to be uh, invited on your show. Thanks very much. Good stuff. No problem at all. Thanks for coming on. Um, how's your day been? It's been manic today, to be honest. I've had back-to-back -back calls um, since about nine this morning, um, which is a great sign. You know, yeah. in, in the sort of industry that I'm in, people... Um, need help right now so uh, you know uh, having those conversations that that, that that can help people is is not a bad place to place to be in at a very difficult time obviously mm. and how's life for you at the minute it's interesting uh, it, it's good i mean i've been locked down for six months um i'm, I'm out, out in west yorkshire right. um, not not too far out of leeds but in a little village so you don't really get to experience it except this week i sort of ventured out for the first time I uh, went down to London for a couple of days um, right. on business and it was surreal to, to see London, central London, so sort of desolate almost, you know, I spent yeah. a lot of time in Covent Garden and it, and it was, yeah, it's surreal is the word to describe it. You know, the tube was quiet, the, the, the Ubers and taxis were quiet and mm. it, it was, it was a different experience. That is quite scary. And obviously, you don't realise the magnitude until, like you said, you go to a major city like, say, London, where normally, even when you see it on TV, uh, it's always kind of hustle and bustle. Everyone's kind of here, there and everywhere. So to hear that is quite, kind of quiet, it's a bit scary, to be honest. Yeah, it, it, it is. It brings it home that we're in the middle of something truly unique. Not, not that we didn't know already. Yeah. Um, but for me, it was, you know, the last time I was in London, you know, you couldn't breathe on the tube. It was it was crazy. And that was sort of January when these sorts of things were just start. We were starting to get an awareness of it. Mm. Um, but yeah, it was it was very telling. Definitely scary times. But hopefully, I mean, it's starting to uh, pick up now. Um, hopefully going forward, things will be slightly easier for, well, easier for everyone. Um, but like I said, thanks for coming on. Um, if you want to just tell us what you do and, and what it involves and um, obviously what you do on a daily basis. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, I founded a company called The Leaders Advisory. And I suppose, if you like, it's the culmination of, you talk about transferable skills. It's, it, I was in football for most of my life as a, as a coach, as a manager, mm -hmm. um, with some really good moments along the way and, and some tough, tough lessons along the way. And transitioned into business a couple of times and most recently 12 months ago where I you know I'm at that age in my life where you know a lot of a lot of a lot of men in in, in their 50s you know find that point in their lives where they they're trying to understand what their purpose is so yeah. for me it was about say, thinking okay what what is a purpose-led business for me and what does what can I do that captures 30 years of high level business experience and a high performance football environment, bring those together in a purpose led way. What, what can I do and what, what does that actually mean? So the leaders advisory has been founded with that in mind and it, and it, it, it started out and launched in January, started out to really focus on leaders and teams under scrutiny, under pressure. Um, you know, I study a lot of, of, of statistics about employee engagement and, you know, how, for example, um, you know, more than 50% of people that quit work quit because of the manager. So there's, there's a lot of problems to be solved out there and there's ways to, to help people that are not explored perhaps deeply enough or people think it's a bit too complicated to tackle. Yeah. So, so I'm tackling some of those problems and, uh, Getting, getting some good wins along the way already, which is fantastic. Fantastic. That's brilliant. And I mean, to come up with an idea like that, I mean, as you know, people come up with ideas all the time and sometimes they never come to fruition. And for you to be kind of in, involved in football for a long period of time and then to step away from that and to start something in this period in your life at this point in time as well, where it's obviously very poignant, that's massive. Um, I mean, in terms of yourself, what made you go into that environment? I know you touched on it slightly, um, but when, like, when you were making that transition, you said you made a few different transitions along the way. Um, 
how did you find that process? Like, did you get help from elsewhere? Obviously, the older you get, naturally, you're going to get, you're going to have more experience just through kind of going through life in general. But the transition doesn't make it any, it doesn't mean because you're of a certain age, the transition is going to be any easier as opposed to someone who may be 18 or 19. So how did you find that process? Yeah, it's a great question. And I'll answer that in two parts. I think the, the first the first part was, you know, me, me as a person, I've, I've always had a level of curiosity. Mm. So even when I was in football, I'd often step outside of football to liaise with leaders and managers from other sectors to understand, you know, what, what drives them, what, mm. what, help, what helps them be successful in the fields that they're in. And it was funny, I'd, I'd moved over from, you know, the large chunk of my career was overseas. I moved back for a, a job at Sheffield United as, as, as head of recruitment. Right. And um, I was having lunch one day with a guy I'd met through football. And he was a CEO of a really big uh, supply chain transport operation, you know, heavy machinery, trains right. coming in and out all day. And, uh, you know, we're having lunch. And I said, what, what, what could somebody with my background in sport offer in terms of transferable skills to a business like yours. It was like one of those moments where he almost, you know, fell off his chair and said, <laughs> we, we can't, we can't get people like you in, in our business. And, and yeah. you know, I didn't really know, you know, it's sort of throw away lines until you explore yeah. it a little bit deeper. Yeah. And uh, we went from, from lunch to, to a, a, another, another dinner. And as we engaged, deeper my curiosity was was piqued my um i suppose desire for continuous growth and development was was stimulated and you know without <laughs> without um wanting to make too much of it there was a compelling offer put under the table was that, that, that was too too good to turn down so it and i didn't know what that meant other than a very steep learning curve i went I had to study um, in a completely new industry mm. and I, I went back to Australia to, to take up this, this role in a massive joint venture. You know, we're talking billion dollar contract. Mm. And, you know, I, I think the term imposter syndrome is thro thrown around quite a lot at the moment. I didn't actually have that. What I had was, I've got absolutely no idea mm. why I'm here. So it wasn't like I knew why I was there and didn't feel like I could do the job. I didn't yeah. actually know why I was there. I had this like five page job description yeah. that made not a lot of sense to me. Really? So I, I sort of got crammed with, um, I felt like it was like a university degree in three months where I had this really steep learning curve. And then I was thrown into a completely new environment. And I'll never forget, I was, I was put on a live project. So it was the, it was the, the one memory I've got where I really knew I was transferring into another sector and mm. I had to do a live uh, work project as part of my training mm. in Allerton Rail Depot. So I'm, I'm a Mancunian, I'm a, I'm a Man United fan. Um, okay. <laughs> I, had, I had to spend two weeks in, in Liverpool um, and I was working with five different shift workers teams. Yeah standing under massive dirty old diesel trains with a hard hat on and a high vis vest and <laughs> doing a standard work project trying to trying to help northern rail improve the performance of five different teams over a period wow. of time so in, incredible learning um, yeah. learning curve so that that's the first part of it mm. and the second part of 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 the transferable process for me was to go from um, I'd just come back from, so I, I, I took on that role, went back into football in, as an A-League manager, mm. um, crashed and burned, okay. came back to the UK, um, and I did a couple of short-term projects overseas in football, one in, one in China, okay. um, and one in, one in India. So again, fantastic, colourful um, experiences that add a lot of uh, a lot of interest to to the backstory and to your own to your own life story, but 
it just served to to suggest that it, the time was right for me to to really settle back in the UK and mm. Um, I looked at football and I looked at business and en ended up in, in technology and I was following the same path that I followed when I transitioned the first time out of football. So coming back out of football for a second time mm. was um, another exciting adventure for me. New business, new sector, technology, Microsoft, fast moving, you know, much, you know, I wasn't under trains anymore. I was behind a laptop and it was all high tech stuff, not really my, not really my thing, mm -hmm. um, but interesting nonetheless. And it was during the course of, 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 of this work that I was starting to become more aware of that sense of uh, not being fulfilled. Right. And it, it required a lot of deep reflection, a lot of, um, you know, stripping back the layers, really peeling, peeling the onion to, to, to get to understand at a deeper level, what my core values are, what, what my purpose, what my purpose is. And at that point, when I realized that, you know, I look back at my football career and I think, okay, when was I at my best and what was I doing and who was I serving? Mm. Um, I was able to identify that, that helping other people is what was driving me. So I, I'm not addicted to the grass like a lot of football coaches or football managers are. Yeah. It, it, understanding that with clarity and then working out that that that, that is what what was really driving driving that mm. um, was was the key for me. And then it's about okay, well, how do you? T uh, I, I knew that there was a you know, I've got the backstory, I've got the experience. How, yeah. how do you then put that into a, a, a service and pur purpose-led service business that can actually have an impact uh, the way that you want it to? And then that's a whole nother adventure. That's, that's about, it's about personal brand. It's about um, content creation. It's, a, it's about website development. It's all, it's all of the things that go into to building, a, building a business, which has been a really... Uh, a really exciting thing for me. That's massive. And you, you mentioned there that you transitioned away from football a couple of times and the transitions were like literally on a massive scale because you've been to a certain degree thrown in at the deep end and the two massive projects which are kind of opposite ends of the scale. Um, yeah. And obviously you've, you've dealt with that which shows obviously character uh, and to a certain extent shows resilience as well. And you mentioned everyone talks about imposter syndrome and I completely get it but you mentioned you didn't have, a, have that which was obviously quite funny just because you literally didn't know what you were getting yourself in, into so you didn't know why you were there so in theory you couldn't have imposter syndrome anyway um, mm. but yeah I mean that that is it's massive and I'll go back slightly because right at the top of the uh, top of your answer you mentioned there that it kind of all started where you had uh, lunch or, or coffee with um, someone that you knew so, and you mentioned that when you spoke to that person, you said, you asked the question, like, how does someone like me from a sporting background get into the industry that you're in? And that person said, well, we don't, we can't get people like you. So did you invariably change his or her mindset? Was he saying or she saying that based on the fact that they tried and failed or literally saying you can't actually come into our industry? What was the answer kind of based on? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it was a... Uh... It was a, um, I reflect back on, on him and he's still a mentor of mine today. I think he is a unique and rare sort of manager who recognized through what he knew of, he didn't know me very well, knew me from a distance and was introduced to me um, through football in, in Australia, through the A-League. Mm -hmm. um, he understood um, self-awareness, emotional intelligence, those, those types of traits. Okay. And, and he was referring to, I found out later, um, th the fact that in, in that sort of industry, there's a, there's a large number of people uh, very technically proficient, you know, real subject matter experts, PhDs in engineering, Mm. Um, supply chain wizards, logistics experts, you know, there's numbers crunching everywhere and mm. you know, big, 
big contracts at play, lots of service level agreements and things like that, big commercial deals being done. And what was lacking as I grew into that business was the softer skills. So I found myself um, almost like peacemaker is the wrong word, but being able to, to get between our subject matter experts and the people that were driving the contract at, at their side right. and, and being able to sort of smooth, smooth the way a little bit so mm. that we were able to listen better to what the customer was saying mm. and we were able to communicate better in, in the other way. And, you know, those intangible things are for a business like that are really hard to measure, yeah. but he had the ability to recognize that that was the gap mm. in his business that somebody like me could fill. And, you know, I'm really appreciative that, that he saw that because that, that fills you with confidence as well that, you know, their strengths you perhaps know that you've got um, and be, being able be, for, for somebody else to see that and, and actually give you the, um, he just sort of let me go. Yeah. It, it, there was no micromanagement. There's nobody looking over my shoulder. It was just mm. like you cut loose in this, in this massive enterprise mm. and sort of find you, he just allowed me to find my way, which was amazing. Amazing the leadership on his part. That was good for him to see that. And obviously I resonate with what you're saying because sometimes you do some like, like myself, I believe in my own ability, whether it be obviously what I'm doing now and obviously when I was playing football as well, but yeah. for someone else to recognize that, it, I don't care who you are, for someone else to recognize your talents and back you, it will always bode well and it naturally will always make you, <clears throat> sorry, will always make you want to perform better. Yeah. And that's, um, I, I kind of, I, I found that with a few different managers when I was playing. And I always realized myself, I don't know whether it was through choice or just natural kind of um, habitat where I perform better for those managers just because they they shown to me that they believed in me. Um, yeah. And I've spoken to many athletes before I was even doing the podcast. And it's always the same scenario. You naturally play better for a manager that believes in you. Um, aside from other kind of facets and strands that will always factor into your performance anyway, as an individual yeah. and as a team. Um, so for, for yourself, I'm assuming that was the same. Um, but I mean, over the years, because I've done, obviously I've done some research and we've had a chat and stuff, and I know you've been in kind of um, sport for well, around 25 years, there or thereabouts, to some capacity anyway. Um, and yeah. you've worked with many people within the UK and overseas, as you, as you mentioned already. And obviously you've come across many, many different people and many, many different athletes as well. So out of all the athletes that you've kind of um, come across, whether it be through work or just conversation or whatever it may be, I know it's a bit of a broad question because there's many out there. What would you say um, are the transferable skills that you've noticed in those athletes that are transferable to other uh, industries or careers or whatever it may be? And also, I mean, when I say transferable skills, I'm not just focusing on outside of sport because it can still be within sport, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Uh, I think the key to, to any of that is understanding yourself first. And, and when, when people um, are shown how to do that, so, mm. you know, I did it for myself, did all the self-awareness stuff. Mm. Um, and, and what it does, it gives you, um, it really, it, it, it shows you what, what maybe you shouldn't do. So great examples are, you know, people make statements like um, certain types of people make good managers. Um, they'll make statements like he or she's not a team player um, or, you know, there's only certain types are cut out to be entrepreneurs. So they'll make statements like that, which they're not really grounded in reality. What, what, yeah. what they fail to do is appreciate, um, number one, that everybody is unique, Com completely um yes some people have got similar traits um yeah. but everyone is fundamentally unique just like dna so if you did a snapshot um did a, a personality profile of all the managers in football you would find managers from every point on the personality spectrum they would come from everywhere so it completely dispels the myth that yeah. only yeah. certain types of people can be managers whether that's football or anyone else. Sometimes people that 
um, put their hand up to be managers are not always the best people to become managers it's yeah. sometimes the, the traits that the people that are a bit more withdrawn or, or hold a bit back yeah. sometimes better placed to do that so i think it comes from um for, so for sports people getting that that insight into into who they are what drives them what holds them back and then applying that to something that they love to do so if you're really, um, so if you're going to go for, say you're a footballer and you're, you're going to go into a, you wanted to be an entrepreneur, you wanted to start yeah. a business. Mm. If you were really process oriented, mm. you might be really suited to opening a McDonald's franchise. Okay. Perfect. Mm. If, if you were a bit more of an adventurer and a bit more um, agile and flexible in your mindset and you're, open to new ideas and always chasing something different yeah. it might be um a tech startup might be more up your alley where it's changing all the time it's fast moving you try something you fail you try something else and mm. you, you know you've got that different sort of approach mm. so in order to understand that it, it really is about understanding yourself first mm. so i would say that no that nothing is off off limits in terms of transferable skills what is really important i think for sports people is the grounding that they've had in collaborative work in teamwork uh, you know so and even if you're an individual athlete mm. there's usually you're surrounded by um a team of people yeah. who've all got the same the same purpose you know mm. the vision is to win a medal or the vision is to win the tour de france you know there's a whole range of people with different characteristics and skill sets that underpin those those successful teams mm. so i i would say that that nothing's off limits and and i think there's a there's a general sentiment out there that sports people are a bit like the military guys the, the guys that come out of military are, are often acquired by businesses because of those systems and attributes and, and, and qualities that they bring and, and i think sports people have got similar um you know they're not putting themselves in harm's way every week but they're going through similar sorts of regimes and that can add a lot of value to 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 any business i think the the mistake is to is to for businesses looking at it the other way to treat the sports people with a celebrity head on it's about treating them as unique individuals that can bring a lot more than that to the table and sometimes that that can be a mistake to you know, to 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 not really go deeper than than it just being that mm, definitely and i will always say that um any sports person whether it be kind of i don't know ex-judo um, I don't know, champion, footballer, tennis player, cricket, rugby, a sports person, man or woman, they will naturally bring something different to the table, whether it be in an office or in a warehouse or whatever it may be. And it's just because of obviously what they've done, having been a sports person. Um, I can't think of any other industry um, that will offer those type of, type of capabilities. Um, so... For me, I've always said this, and sometimes I do think that industries and organisations are missing out by not willingly trying to employ ex-sports people or even current ones. Um, just, just because, like I said, so many transferable skills, um, and obviously we can we tend to see things from a different perspective. I know I do. Um, I mean, I work in property now, and I'm working in an office environment, and I think yeah. sometimes I see things from a different perspective just because i haven't been institutionalized it's just like say if i was still playing football now and i was playing football from i don't know seven eight nine up until 31 i retired so yeah. if i was still playing now say if i was mid-20s and i was still playing someone from i don't know Coventry university came to train with us for a week they would see things from a different perspective and invariably yeah. that did happen often we'd have people coming in don't know on various different teams i played for 
now and again you'd have someone coming in from the uni or whatever and they'd just train with us and they would ask us questions that we'd never really had conversations about before so obviously they're seeing things from a different perspective um, and I think that's the same when it comes to athletes working within a different environment outside of sport or whether it may be inside of sport maybe in a boardroom or whatever um, we will always naturally see things from a different perspective um, what are your thoughts on I mentioned there about like organizations and industries not maybe not employing uh, former athletes what are your thoughts on that do you think they're missing out I think there's opportunities there I, I, I think um, they have to be clear about what are the dynamics that that they that they need in their business that a sports person can bring and then match and match that with the sports person that they want to bring in yeah um, so I've, because I've got this I'm, you know, I'm very specific now about um, about two things really one is environment so the environment being right for the person that comes in mm. you know and I'm talking about character not skills I'm talking about the, the characteristics the, the natural qualities that somebody brings to a team and, and uh, the best teams have got a mix of of all those different yeah. personalities, you know, you need somebody to ask the tough questions, mm. um, but you also need somebody who's a bit more social that brings people together, and yeah. you need someone to to give the bollockings when they need to be dished out. And not mm. everyone can do it, or or not everyone can do it naturally. Mm. So I think I think where business can benefit from within themselves and and by tapping into the sporting arena. Mm. is to really identify um, the gaps that they've got in their in their teams mm. and if, if if they fill them with those qualities and characteristics from within professional sport mm. wow then you've got a really powerful commodity on your hands you've got a really powerful mix of of of, uh, of transferable skills coming into the building mm, definitely i agree with everything you said there um, and I've always said on, on my podcast, I always say kind of athletes, although we always say, look, more help needed than whatever, but as an athlete, you, you still need to have that um, understanding that if you don't ask, you're not going to get. Um, and I think it's probably easy to do whilst you're in the environment because you're surrounded by, even a, let's take it, for example, as like a football team. So within football team or football club, you've got, finance department, you've got the commercial department, you've got all those different facets within your kind of reach on a daily basis. So go and ask the questions. Um, I never did. Um, I don't know, maybe I missed out. Um, I missed out on that opportunity, but looking back now, maybe I should have gone and spoke to the finance people just to see how they do things, how they see things from what's their perspective on the club. Because as players, sometimes you get stuck in that, I say bubble a lot, and you get stuck in that bubble whereby you're just a player. You train, you train hard, you go in, you go home after training, do what you need to do, and, and that's kind of it. Um, I'm not talking about like things outside of football, because for me, I, in terms of my personality, I was always me first and then the footballer second, but I didn't really use my network whilst I was playing. It's only kind of um, since I've come out of football that I've started to like, be on LinkedIn and talk to people that I've never probably dreamed of speaking to before. Um, so I always say to anyone, like, you need to have the gumption to go out and obviously look for it yourself because unless you're, of, unless you're a household name or a high-profile athlete, nothing's really going to be given to you on a plate. And even sometimes, if you are high-profile, you still may not get an opportunity. The last thing you want to be doing is waiting around for the phone to ring. Um, so I, as a player, I mean, when I was looking for new clubs and stuff, I would always ring around and speak to different managers. Um, yeah. That was just me. Um, so I've taken that kind of outside of football now obviously I've taken that into my day-to-day -day life and um, that's just in my character but not everyone's like that people will naturally wait for their agent to, to do the groundwork and then berate their agent because the agent hasn't found the club and things and sometimes you, you have to go out and do these things yourself um, yeah. and like I said if you don't ask the answer is always going to be no anyway so for you in terms of like your transition obviously you got given your opportunity based on having lunch or coffee with someone and you asked that question and then that person yes. saw something in you because they knew you to a certain degree and knew your character and gave you the opportunity so from there you've kind of got to where you are now and that's all it took for you to ask that question if you didn't bring it up you probably wouldn't have mentioned anything you probably would have been i don't know spoke about something else 
um, and then your, your kind of career path maybe would have taken a different uh, step to, towards something else. So this is why I get people on the podcast because I want people to tell their story. And yeah. every person I've spoken to, there's kind of they're not all the same. They're all everyone's got their own individual story and they have their own path that they're following. Um, so I mean, I don't know what your thoughts on are on that. Well, I, I think it's a it's a really great perspective that you've got, and I think that um, the and let take football for an, for an example as an example. You know, the career's X amount of years, you know, injury permitting, you know, maybe up to your early 30s to mid 30s these days mm. with, with the f- fitness regime. So, and people start to think about transition as they're coming to the end of that rather than before. And I know there's different programs that clubs put on that people can can do different things, which, which are great. Mm. Um, but that's typically how it goes. I think where the awareness needs to needs to grow or, or could be helped is that that these players again using football as an example even at, at the lower leagues um they've got a personal brand already you know they're popular they there's a net there's a whole network of fans that go there every week mm-hmm. who some of which would be in business and might love to have a conversation mm-hmm. and i think once people recognize that um that their personal brand is okay and it's not just about that they've got the advantage of having a, a an existing brand as a as a footballer what they need to do is round that out with yeah. some some uh, some identity work yeah. to really uncover everything about them you know so so when they show up for a meeting with a business person you know without having to reel off what their values are they're actually living out through the way that they speak, the way that they present. Mm. So the business guy that's sitting over the table goes, wow, what a great player he, he was or she was. And wow, what an even better person. I'd really yeah. love to start working with them. Mm. So I think the the opportunity for sports people is enhanced by the fact that they are sports people to start with. Mm. I, think, I think for many, they need to be guided better in how to convert that into more value and perhaps earlier in in the decision making process definitely yeah yeah it's true i mean for me and i've said this many times and people are probably getting bored of me saying it but i'll continue saying it so when i was playing i I always thought right when i get to 24 25 if i haven't made enough money to then think right i'm going to put that into something and start my own thing i'm probably going to have to work so that was in my mindset although at that time i was still trying to make it as high as high as, uh, as I could in terms of playing football, in terms of level, uh, and play for as long as I could, naturally. But at the same time, I always had it in the back of my head that I'd be prepared to work. And I, I, yes, I did want a career, but worst case scenario, I, I know I've got friends and family who have maybe got their own business. I mean, I've got brothers and sisters who are a lot older than me, and they've got friends who maybe would have given me the opportunity. So I'd never, I always knew I'd never struggle to work because I was always willing to, to go and work. So if I came away from football and then suddenly I was working on a building site, I wouldn't be afraid to tell friends and family that I'm working on a building site, regardless of their reaction. And sometimes I think, not well, I know for a fact not everyone's like that. So they end up playing until they're 39, 40, 41. Um, maybe they don't even want to, but they don't want to step away from playing football. So they yeah. want to stay, they want to hang on as long as possible, maybe to the detriment of their, their career, just for the simple fact that they may not be able to sustain a, a decent level. So their performance is probably dropped because their fitness levels aren't there and they're just hanging on, potentially tarnishing their reputation. So for me, I never really had that problem. I always thought, well, if I have to work, I have to work and I'll happily go and do so. And I think a lot of players may need to get into that mindset, more so the lower league players. So I'm talking like League One, League Two and below because, yeah, the money's okay, but it's not amazing and you're not going to be able to retire off the back of that. So they're going to have to work regardless. Um, so they need to get in that mindset. And the earlier you get into that mindset, the easier the transition, I think anyway, the easier the, tra- the transition away from football or whatever sport you're doing will be for the simple fact that you, you're kind of prepared to a certain degree. And if you are physically doing something in terms of preparation, whether it be a course or working part-time or whatever, whatever that's even better. Um, because again, that will make the transition a lot easier. Um, I'm one of the lucky ones. I found a job 
probably had a couple of months in between playing and, and finding a job and that couple of months was my choice so it's not like I was kind of scratching around trying to find clubs and, and things like that I just I wanted a rest and then latterly I, I started looking for work and then got an interview and then the first interview I had got a second interview with the same company and then managed to get the job so I just basically saw myself through my personality and obviously it offered them what transferable skills that I would well that I carry that are kind of um, needed within the company that I was working for at the time so again it's about selling yourself through your transferable skills and your personality as opposed to telling them that you played for whatever club and you've won so many medals because it means nothing to them because you're not going to bring anything to the to their company it adds no value um so again this is something that i always like to portray in my podcast and, and make people aware um for you um because i know i think personally aside from the athletes needing to do more i do think more help's needed um what are your thoughts on that do you think more help's needed for athletes when it comes to their retirement yeah i think so i think there's again there's a couple of sides to that if you think about mental health mm. for one um there's you know a real need and you know there's a real movement there's a real need for mental health support mm. and what happens frequently with with footballers and the military again is a great example mm. when people have started that from a young age and don't identify with anything else mm. so they they don't really um unless they've got that self that innate self-awareness they just identify with being a footballer and when that stops or is coming to an end then they start they, they hit a roadblock because the value or self-worth just disintegrates when they no longer identify with being what they thought was what made them good yeah so so the help needs to come you know, I read a bit about Man United's academy and I, I work with Coxie at Sheffield United and, he's, mm. you know, I know the types of um, the, the, the types of things that he'll bring in to help to really live by the standards of a more rounded, you know, putting the player first rather than the footballer first. And, yeah. and I think I think there's lots of my from my experience, there's lots of uh, there's lots of talk about that and often delivering against it comes some way short of, of because everybody wants to be the one that helped the footballer get to where they got and all that sort of yeah. stuff you know it's not yeah. it's, it's natural you know the best players get looked after better and the mm. coaches want to be with the best you know there's all sorts of stuff going on yeah. but the real the real challenge is to help people much earlier in their careers mm. to start this this process of uh recognizing who they are at their core because when they find that they'll actually for the rest of their career they'll be better players as well okay. because they'll be at peace with who they are mm. uh, they'll know what challenges they face day to day mm. they'll know why certain players um, that they play with really annoy them and mm. they'll be able to manage those relationships better they'll mm. know why the manager just drives them nuts yeah and they'll they'll, they'll find ways to make that work or they'll be able to make better decisions with their agent to to find a more suitable situation so mm. that type of work which is the same type of work that i'm doing now in in business mm. makes a massive difference mm. you can be a really good ceo um and when people ask you uh you know if you never met somebody before and you have a con uh, never met someone before you have a conversation with them and they just tell you what they do it's really a conversation about anything deeper than that. Mm. I think if we can get beyond that surface level, yeah. I'm a footballer, I'm a CEO, I'm a salesman. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll certainly be helping get ahead of the mental health curve. Mm. And we'll also be creating more opportunities for, for people to come out of the game in a more rounded way. Definitely. Um, I mean, there's a couple of things that I want to touch on there because I, I played for well, many, many different teams. And obviously, when you play for a team, you're, you're immersed in that kind of team environment. You've got your kind of, um, there's always going to be, say, clicks and in inverted commas because you naturally uh, you naturally connect uh, or you're drawn towards people who maybe match your personality or got similar interests. Um, although you are still in a team environment, 
Um, and then when you leave, yeah, you say you're going to keep in touch and invariably you do keep in touch with a couple of them. But then when you join your new club, you're immersed in that club. But if I'm looking back at all the ex-teammates that I've come across, there's probably a handful that I, I actually really, really know. And when I say really know, I mean like what their interests are outside of football and what used to get on their nerves and uh, like how many, like, I don't know, how many family members I've got and things like that. Um, so from that perspective, I mean, this is me. So I, I like to just talk to people and stuff anyway. Um, and that's coming from me. So if I'm saying that I didn't really know all of my teammates, it, what, what's, what's the situation for everyone else? like past and present players because I know it must still be it must be the same scenario I mean you'll be able to tell me the same for yourself I mean how many footballers or how many ex-teammates do you know that you actually really really know and yeah and, and you know I've been I've been at the I've been at the pointy end of that from a from a managerial point of view yeah and the the biggest failing was in not getting close enough to the individuals in, mm. in the last big job that I had. Um, yeah. And you have to take full response. It doesn't matter what, what, what was going on around, mm. around all that. Um, as a leader, you have to take full responsibility. And that's empowering. It's yeah. empowering to walk away from a, a situation uh, with your tail between your legs because it, it, it was tough and, yeah. and, and really reflect hard on... Um, what you could have done differently, and the, the you know the best we know that the best lessons are in the are in the tough you know when you get knocked down, course, yeah. um, and I think that having that um, the resources to be able to understand that and then know what you can action to for for it not to I mean I'm not a manager I'm not a football manager anymore, mm. um, but that's you know, if 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 it if it did ever happen again, it's not part of the plan. Yeah. You know, that's not this. I wouldn't make that mistake again. Mm. Yeah. I mean, one thing again to touch, go back slightly. One thing that frustrates me, um, and still frustrates me now, is the fact that when I was a player, even though I didn't have any kind of outside interests in terms of, say, in, in inverted commas, distractions. So I know people who've got clothing lines and people that study in and people that have got other interests, even in other sports. So you could be playing football, but you've got an interest in, say, motorsport. Yeah. When a manager got wind of it, or uh, like um, a member of the staff, when they got wind of it, it was always, it was always frowned upon. And it was as if, as if like, well, that, that's a distraction from your performance, whether it be in training or on the pitch, on a Saturday or a Tuesday in a game. And I always thought, well, why is it a distraction? Because... Surely if that person's got an outside interest and they're not solely just focused on football, football, football or whatever it may be, your chosen sport, surely their performance is going to um, like be enhanced if they've got an outside interest. And then obviously, latterly now, when I've done a bit of research and spoken to various different people, academics and stuff, and the, the stats are there to show that if, if an athlete's got outside interest away from their chosen sport, which isn't going to be physically detrimental to their chosen sport and their performance, it's going to actually enhance their performance. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. I, I mean, I'm assuming it was a similar scenario when, when you were involved in football as well. It, it's, um, it's uh, your perspective is, is, is brilliant because it's reflecting where my business is at and where my business is targeted because one size doesn't fit all. So if you're a manager that's totally obsessed with the game, that's a pretty unhealthy state to be in for yourself and for lots of the players that you're working with because yeah. you're unique and so, so are they. Yeah. So for somebody like you that's, that's got other interests and that balances you and helps you bring the right energy to your football training and your yeah. football games, perfect. That should be yeah. what everybody's uh, aiming for. Mm. Uh, and it's, it's different for everyone yeah. and by, by approaching it that way um, so the manager has that understanding with you mm. and he has the different understanding with somebody else mm. but also then has the skill that the collective appreciate that everybody else has got those differences mm. you know and that's, that's cultural as well as uh, as well as uh, hobbies or, or lifestyle, whatever choices people make, 
Mm. If if the club and the manager are skilled enough and mature enough to to allow that entity to breathe and be um, be its what it what it's capable of becoming, then I think that's where the gold is. Yeah. And I've made you know I've had successful teams and and I've and I've failed massively as well. Mm. Um, and and what I'm learning about about business. Uh, what I've learned about business and what I, what I'm taking into business is is exactly that. That you know, for an, an example is cool. the, the word culture is thrown around a lot. The club's got a great culture, or the the business has got a great culture. What do you and mean? What, <laughs> what 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 that tends to the, the chances of that being truly accurate are pretty slim yeah. because one culture doesn't fit everybody, and right. if the only the only way therefore that that could be a great culture is if it's a culture that caters for individual differences mm. is accepted is tolerant is um you know is mature enough to mm. to be able to operate in that way yep. and, and i get that this that doesn't take away the fact that you know the game demands what the game demands you've got to perform on a saturday otherwise you don't succeed of course yeah it's a given Everybody knows what those, but they know what distance you need to run, how fast you need to run, how good you need to be at dribbling. You yeah. know, you've got to win your headers and all that. Mm. Um, but that's not about that's your skill set. That's like me going into the transport sector yeah. with PhDs in engineering mm. who are brilliant at engineering. They know what what their job is. They they were doing engineering when they went home. They yeah. they were restaurateurs or they were playing hockey or they were doing different things so yeah. it's, there's no different mm. no different 100 percent true i mean uh, to be honest i never had any outside interests i know aside from the usual stuff socializing going to cinema going to restaurant whatever it may be that's just standard procedure but in terms of like other interests as in academic or um other industry interests i, I didn't really have any i know players that did uh, for me, I always like to read, so away games or in a hotel, I'd, I'd take a book and oh, luckily no one really said anything to me, uh, whether that be down to my character or whatever, I don't know, but even to this day, I still, I'm still like an avid reader on, on various different subject matter. Um, that's just me. Um, but I want to touch on yourself in terms of what you're doing now in more detail, because I know you've worked within clubs, as in football clubs, and you've worked with like big organisations in the UK and overseas. So go into more detail in terms of like what you do. Like, do you go into a company and dissect where they're going wrong, and then like maybe come up with a formula in order to enhance their performance, or like, how does it work? Yeah, there's two, there's two parts to my business now. So, so the first, the primary focus, and what started out with, was okay, le leadership under pressure, leadership under scrutiny, and you know when you ask. <laughs> When you're asked by Mark Bosnich on, on live TV whether it's time you resigned or not, you sort of get a feel for, I've, you know, I've been, I've, I've been at, the, at the cutting edge where, you know, most, really CEOs, don't, mo, mo, yeah, mo, most wow. CEOs don't, don't, are not under that level of scrutiny. And, and I get social media and, and the fans and the team's not doing mm. well, you're going to get, you know, you, 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 you take your punishment. Mm. But it, and, and my uh, ability to, um, to deal with that is is okay. I'm good with all that. It's yeah. external. It's noise. Mm. It, 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 that's not really the story. But it's where the the, the leadership under pressure, leadership under scrutiny um, ethos came from. It's like okay, if if performance under those circumstances can be improved, what does that look like? Yeah. And, and then there's stories that you could take into business and people go, wow, that, you know, tell us more. So you got, you know, storytelling is a great thing in mm -hmm. business in life. So, so that, that's the premise. So I'll give you an example, working with an organization at the moment under incredible pressure, you know, there's a downward pressure on, on manufacturing, for example, yeah. uh, because people have stopped buying aircraft or people, people have stopped, you know, the supply chain's drying up, all, all sorts of things. Yeah. So, so people are getting made redundant before they were furloughed. So everybody's, now people are working remotely. So all of their, what, what was normal to them, what, if, if they were really functional before, they've now been thrown a curveball yeah. that they have to deal with. 
and they may or may not be prepared or equipped to handle that in the best way possible. Mm. So what, what we know is that two, two big things, two, the two big problems that exist at the moment. One is not getting the, the people doing the things that they're best suited to do right. often enough is one big, big contributor to disengagement, underperformance, stress, ill health, absenteeism. So that clocks up billions of quid over the course of a year in all sorts of costs. Mm. And the second one is managers um, not being skilled enough. An example would be you're the top salesperson for three years in a row, mm. equivalent in football. Uh, you come into the end of your career, you've been a top striker, you get thrown straight into the manager's hot seat with no other training yeah. other than the experience that you've had. Mm. It might work chances are it's going to be difficult. Yeah. So this is what happens in business. You get managers um, promoted uh, without the same toolkit that they were given to do the job that they're really good at. Right. And then they suddenly go, um, um, what do I do here? You know, so they'll avoid difficult conversations or they'll, whatever it might be. Yeah. So, so my, my business, the leader's advisory is tackling um, those problems so helping businesses solve those problems by working with leaders to help them know themselves better right. help them know how to work with others better and one of the most important things you know there's uh, the stats I was reading earlier this week so, something like it's only between 10 and 20 percent of teams in the modern workplace are high performing teams so that means 80 odd percent of teams in the modern workplace are underperforming wow. so that's where my experience and the methodology that goes into that can can help. So, if, example, you do a team mapping exercise. If, if you find that um, a lot of the, the people in one team are from the same uh, part of the personality spectrum, yeah. then there's gaps that need to be filled, and they need to be filled by the, the manager driving a different set of behaviors, but, but with a lot of care, because if you take people too far out of the comfort zone for too long, they get stressed, yeah. they get mental health issues, mm. they start looking for other jobs. So it's a really fine and complex balancing act that they've got to, got to do. Mm. So I'm, I'm helping businesses to deal with those situations. Mm. And then the second part of the business, which I'm really excited about, and, and this may be, you know, I'm, I'm this is where I've got early seeds of ideas that, that can help sports people and help footballers mm. is to help more people to help more people. So, so that's my mission is to help more people to help more people. Yeah. That, that's about me being purpose led. That's what drives me. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Mm. And I've, and I've set up a, a, a training program that can qualify people to start their own coaching business or grow their own coaching business okay perfect for sports people yeah come in with their own brand mm -hmm. it's a two-day uh, course and they can either do two things they can either take the certification and they can they can instantly get because it's a, a prescriptive tool it's not doesn't need interpretation so they don't need a degree in psychology to deliver this stuff okay they get they get the tools to underpin the conversations that they're going to have. Right. Um, it's, it's an instant return on investment. So they can either go out and build and grow their own coaching practice with my support. And they might take that into sport. They might take it into business. They might be life coaches. Uh, they might be executive coaches or career coaches. Whatever modality they want to go into, mm. this program is going to help them grow faster. That's, that's what right. I'm excited about. Yeah. And the second part to that is if they don't feel confident or comfortable going on their own, they can join the leaders, advisories and associate and then leverage all of the support and collateral and marketing that, that we can help them then grow. And, and a perfect idea, a perfect example would be I was talking to a, I was talking to a girl who's doing some work at the FA. We were talking about women's football mm. and how their careers are shorter um, the, there's more uncertainty, it's more volatile, the, the wages are, are, are less. So what a great opportunity to 
um, for the PFA or the FA to, to maybe support those that are aspirational and think, okay, I could be, I could be setting up a business from home. All I need is a laptop. I've got the support. I've got the personal brand. Someone will show me how to turn that into a, a marketing yeah. sort of powerhouse. Mm. It's got some real legs. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. That's massive. Um, and that, it sounds really interesting. I think, like you said, it's got, it's definitely got legs in it. Um, I mean, if I was someone who was kind of at a career crossroads or maybe even coming to the end of my career or whatever, in terms of football, that's definitely something I'd look into. And I know those people I've spoken to on the podcast who are in a situation where they're not too sure, especially in these kind of uncertain times during the pandemic, they don't know what's going to happen going forward because contracts that they were given or offered Obviously, clubs are going to naturally going to look at that and reevaluate in terms of finance because they may not be able to um, hook up the funds to, to go forward with a contract. So, so many players are out there now whereby they're stuck in a situation where they, they don't know where they're going to be going forward. Um, yeah. So, I think what you're doing is great um, and that's massive. Um, mm -hmm. One other thing I just wanted to touch on, um, I know you've worked at football clubs in the, in the UK um, like what's what's the situation with, with that? How does that work? Is it a similar kind of mindset when you go into the football clubs in terms of how you work um, with the organisation? Do you, do you input the same sort of type of like situation or material? It, yeah, it's such a new business. I think I think my experience from football um, and the reason why I've started my business in the corporate sector is because mm. the corporate sector. Uh, uh, in many ways, they've been doing this sort of stuff for much longer. So there's there's more sort of it's more broadly accepted. Right. Um, so you know, fo football um, is a is a perfect example of an industry that could benefit greatly from this, from all aspects. You know, mm. from you know, you you talk about your experience um, where. You know, if you'd gone into the into the office of, more often and asked more questions of more people, you might have, you know, learned different things or or found yeah. something that you want. My experience w has been in in different places that there was almost a, 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 a an unwritten rule that their admin were football and never the twain shall meet. Yeah, and, <laughs> well, co coming out of an asset management environment where um, that just would not be part of the charter at all. The, right. the whole the whole value proposition would make if if for the team to win, mm. it needs everybody fat from the fans through to the hot dog seller through to the 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 head of IT mm. to be aware of what value they provide to the organisation and how they in in interweave with each other. Mm. So I think football's got got challenges, but you know, I'm passionate about sport. Um, I'm passionate about, you know, when I made this decision to, to step out and, and, and do what I'm doing now, it was to, it was with an eye on, I'd love to be able to support football from outside the game rather than from within the game. Right. And, and I think that's where I can add the most value. And if, if that's through helping players in transition, um, or coaches to be better at understanding their teams. You know, there's many ways that, that this can be can be weaved into an organisation. That, that's sort of exciting. Yeah. And uh, you know, find, finding that trigger or those 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 key people within the game that, that think it's a great idea and can help mobilise it is. You know, I'm a very partnership oriented yeah. um, operator, and I think people working together um, have got a far better chance of. Of, of, of it succeeding definitely and i think what you're doing has got so many strands as you mentioned there's so many ways and avenues that we can take in order to, to make it grow if that makes sense um and i definitely resonate with what you're saying about people helping people because one of my biggest gripes is when you ask for help and someone may think well this person is trying to emulate what i'm doing for me if I, I would take that as a compliment and i would say if i had a model that was successful i'd say right this is what i did here you go, and then you obviously take it and do what you want with it. But what I find is people will give you a piece and then keep the rest for themselves. And I just yeah. think it's so frustrating. It's so, I think it's childish because 
someone's obviously reaching out to you and they see you as someone who maybe is successful and they want to maybe not emulate what you're doing but you've, you've been and done it to a certain degree and i'm not talking about myself i'm just talking in general um and then they'll go and reach out and i think that's brilliant you've reached out so you've made the, the steps towards progression for yourself so the person you've gone to then thinks okay i'll, I'll give you some of what i know some of my knowledge but i'm not going to give you all of it and i just think that's that's where the world's going wrong just especially in business because i think the more people help people the better everyone's going to be everyone can kind of eat and and, and be happy to certainly be i know that sounds a bit fluffy but it i think it is important um no i'm 100 percent with you the, the way I would describe that or interpret what you said is, is that when, you, when you're very clear about um, what your purpose is and you're comfortable with who you are and what it is that, you, that you're sharing with the world, yeah. um, then all that stuff sort of doesn't really matter because mm. what happens is you start to attract the right people. You start yeah. to attract the people that share the vision, the, the people that, uh, you know, you, you learn to say no to more people okay. for those reasons. You know, coming out of, of, of football, it's a doggy dog environment, as you know. You know, it's yeah. quite cut, it's cutthroat, and mm. uh, people learn to be protective and guarded and and a little bit cynical. Mm. And it's sort of understandable, I think, that 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 people may come out and and have some of those those tendencies. Mm. Um, and they'll always be challenged with that unless they've got the self-awareness to say, hang on, uh, maybe there's a bit more to me or more to life or, or whatever mm. that I need to explore. When they do that and when they're prepared to do that, then they'll, they'll, they can use all of those attributes that they've built over, over years in the game or games or sports that they play mm. to really good effect. Without doing that, um, it's just look at the draw as to whether they'll how far they can take it, I think. Definitely. Um, one more thing, I know I said that a minute ago, but yeah, just one more thing, it's just mm -hmm. popped into my head. Um, I've said this many times, um, especially when I was playing, um, retirement was always seen as a bit of a negative. So whether it was someone asking you the question or whether it was someone maybe reaching the retirement stage of their career, and it was always, okay, well, what am I gonna do next? I don't really know. And it was always, it was never kind of, okay, well, how can I help people? What have I learned? It was never, I never saw or spoke to someone who, who looked at it like that. Um, so for me, obviously I think that mindset needs to change, but I know you've worked with athletes within the UK and overseas. What, have you noticed the difference in terms of how athletes in this country or in the UK approach retirement to maybe those like in Asia or different parts of the world? Is there, is there a difference in their approach? Um, it, it's, it's a bit hard to comment on that because I, I, I probably haven't e been exposed to too much of it. What I will say about retirement, I, I had a, an assistant coach when I was working at a, a, a semi-pro level yeah. uh, in, in Australia. He's an ex-Aussie international. He played for, for West Brom, Millwall, Manchester City. He's called Jason Van Blerk. Okay. Played about 30, I think 30 odd games for Australia. Great guy. Yeah. Um, he came back to, to Australia. And I signed him as an assistant manager and as a player, seeing out his career. Anyway, he, um, he, we won the league, got promoted that season. Mm -hmm. And he was beside himself after the games, distraught, he's in tears. And he, he retired at, at this, you know, compared to where he'd been, this club was, you know, not, not, not we'd built the club from nothing. Right. Been successful. Um, but, the club itself outside of New South Wales, really not, not a known entity. So mm -hmm. he, you know, he's been at Man City, Millwall, he played with King Cladsey and, and those, you know, in that era. Yeah. But he, it was the only thing he'd ever won in his career. Right. And he was so appreciative of mm -hmm. that, that short journey that he shared with us, that obviously it's a memorable enough moment for me to be, to be sharing back, to back, back yeah. with you. Um, and so, and that you know, that's an isolated incident. I think some of my experiences in Australia, um, were, it, it, it was quite a because there's only nine A-league clubs in Australia, and one in New Zealand. Mm. The the, the clamour for jobs 
playing and coaching, it's mm. like desperation state. And, and, and some of the behaviors that come to the surface are, are quite unsavory at times. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, it, other than that, it's, ha it's hard, to, hard, to, hard to say. Other than I know for, for many people, um, it's a difficult uh, decision. It's, mm. it's been, a, you know, so many memories, whether they've been successful or not, you yeah. know, the camaraderie and the experiences that they shared with, 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 with great people along the way, of, of, you know, filled with memories and giving that, that up is very, very difficult. Yeah. And that's why I think, I suppose to sum up, being able to get ahead of that and, and help more people um, to be aware enough to go, you know what, you are a really great person yeah. at this, this and this. Yeah, great footballer. Mm. But guess what? You're doing this, this and this. Have you thought about what you might do next? Because I think you'd be brilliant in these sectors with these yeah. skills. And let's start to network you into those conversations. Absolutely. You make a very good point. Um, in terms of yourself, what transferable skills have you taken from being involved in football into what you're doing now? I've taken... Uh, I've taken a, a lot of, you know, every, every, I, I left England at 21. I was a player coach in Australia at 21, okay. which was, which was, which was crazy. You know, I didn't okay. make it as a player here, right. um, went overseas. Mm. And so I cut my teeth as a coach mm. before I was ready to, to, to coach. And luckily we were successful and I don't take any credit for it. I think what I learned was I, I had some, innate ability to engage and communicate with people which yeah. carried me through mm. and and you learn along the way and you get mentored and developed and and, and all the rest of it and ended yeah. up where i got mm. um so i think my biggest learnings have come from the un, taking the time to understand what makes me tick mm. and what drives me and what holds me back and being able to conquer that because that that's been out it's classic isn't it if you knew it 10 years ago or 20 years ago you'd have taken some different choices along the way yeah. but i don't have any regrets it's, mm. it's you know it's fascinating where i've been and the different mm. countries and the different experiences um i think what sports given me uh all of those lessons you know, until eight years ago when I, you know, in my late 40s, when I, when I transferred out of football, yeah. football had given me all of those, mm. all of those lessons in life, um, winning, losing, uh, dealing with uh, difficult situations. Brilliant. Really enjoyed the chat today. I appreciate you coming on because I know you're really busy. Um, so, yeah, thanks for your time. Um, Thank you. If you want to just let everyone know again where we can find you in terms of shows, social media and obviously the name of the company, um, just to let everyone know, really. Yeah, Tony Wormsley and the company is theleadersadvisory.com. Brilliant. And where can we find you? Social media? Uh, Twitter and LinkedIn. Brilliant. Good stuff. Keep doing what you're doing. Um, sounds really good. Um, I'm going to keep an eye out, obviously, keep in touch going forward. Um, and like I said, um, keep doing what you're doing. Thanks for coming on. Thank you very much, Danny. Appreciate it. Thanks, Danny. Cheers. See you soon. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.